Thank you. I appreciate that. Of course. All right. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Fulton. Thank you, Alyssa. And Alyssa and I are working together on, on a number of things, although we haven't really worked together on hydrogen, but I'm sure we will. Um, everybody eventually is going to work on hydrogen. It's just where it's going. Uh, maybe. So I was asked to talk about me. Is this too loud? Is this okay with the, with the mic? Yeah. Because um, I'm pretty loud. Uh, so yeah, I've been doing sustainable transport for 32 years, and I don't know if it's any more sustainable now. It's probably less, well, less sustainable than it was 32 years ago. So that's that's my you know uh, legacy. Uh, we, we're getting nowhere, but anyway. uh, but uh, it started with a paper I did on electric vehicles in grad school in 1987. And I was in an energy program, but I did this paper on electric vehicles, which apparently didn't exist. I mean, there was the EV1 running on lead acid batteries that went about 50 miles. And uh, but I was really into it, and I ended up doing my career in transportation with my, even though my degree had been mainly on electric power. Um, so yeah, as Alyssa said, I worked in all these places. It's been fun to live and work in different parts of the world. And I particularly have been influenced by my time in Bangladesh and Kenya and thinking about global uh, transitions and how countries that are very, very diverse can manage these kinds of uh, problems. And they're going to manage them in many different ways. Um, I do think that, again, if we're thinking about careers, it's good to move around. It's good to not only do the same thing, even though my general topic's been the same thing for decades. I keep changing the focus. I keep looking at different angles of the problem, and there's many more angles that I haven't looked at. But I think, you know, doing different projects, coming at the big problems in different ways, sometimes economic, sometimes more technical or technology oriented, you learn a lot doing that. So that, that's been fun. Um, and, you know, I'm 61. Dan is 71, Dan Sperling. So if I talk about retirement, he laughs at me. But I think about it, but um, we just opened a Paris center and an India center for the Institute of Transportation Studies, which I'm sure ex students could also maybe uh, participate in when they get really up and running. They're more about research right now than about students, but eventually, hopefully, we'll have student exchanges and that kind of thing. And I'm going to India in January and I'm going to Paris and Brussels in March. So these are good things. And so I don't think I'm going to retire right away. But on the other hand, I did just buy land in Nova Scotia last year. I am Canadian and American. And I thought it would be cool. to It's one of the places you can still get land fairly cheap, close to the ocean. This is 30 feet up uh, on a bluff overlooking the ocean. And I figured that buys me time, uh, <laughs> at least until maybe 2100, uh, before it's lapping, lapping against the top of the hill. But then that was in the spring. And then in September, it got hit head on by one of those hurricanes. So the hurricanes are hitting Nova Scotia now. So I probably didn't think that through very well. So anyway, that's me. Um, let's get into the topics. And um, I'm gonna start by talking about sustainable transportation in California, then get kind of into fuel cell vehicles, since this is mainly gonna be a talk about transportation, even though you folks think bigger about energy, I'm gonna stay in my, my lane here. And I'll talk about fuel cell vehicles, and then I'll talk about hydrogen, and kind of go in that order. So as you no doubt know, California is very aggressive on CO2. Uh, we've got the carbon neutrality uh, target and law that we have to be carbon neutral by 2045. Um, electric systems have to be carbon neutral by 2045. I think there's, you know, there's all interim targets too, and I think by 2040, it has to be 95% or something like that. So hopefully we will figure out how to do this and transition the system in California in the next 23 years, 22, about 22 years, it's not that much time. And in the case of transportation in particular, we have specific targets and not that many places in the world have created specific targets for their transportation system. So California is really on the front edge of a lot of that. A couple of years ago, uh, Governor Newsom said we wanna have 5 million zero emission vehicles in the state. So ZEVs, uh, light duty. Right now we have, I think it's well over one, or it's over 1 million by now. And our uh, rate of growth of sales is such that we should have no trouble with the 5 million target out of about 35 million vehicles in the state by 2030. So that one is like, okay, we pretty much got that covered. Um, I'll come back in a minute to the 
actual schedule of increase of ZEVs that the ARB has issued, which are really challenging and much, much stronger than that 5 million number. Um, and then I'll just mention that on the fuel side, we have something called the low carbon fuel standard. Maybe some people have learned about that. It's a very interesting policy and it's a very good policy for ex students to understand because it's basically like a fee and rebate system or a credit trading system for transportation fuels. And so there's every year a carbon intensity target or requirement. If your fuels that you're selling like gasoline or diesel have a worse carbon intensity, you pay, you buy credits because you have to get, otherwise you have to get down to that, to that level. And if you're below that level, you can sell credits like uh, uh, biofuels companies and uh, electricity, uh, electric utilities can sell credits for their lower carbon uh, energy as long as it's going to transportation. And that has a target of a 20% reduction in fuel carbon intensity by 2030. Very important and powerful policy. And I'll mention that in as of a couple of months ago, our diesel fuel pool for diesel vehicles in the state is now over 40% biodiesel, actually renewable diesel, it's kind of biodiesel. That's got to be among the highest in the world. And then there's travel, which I'm not going to talk much about today, but the state always has tried to figure out how to lower the rate of how much we travel and always fails. But right now we, we, get, we gave up on the 10% reduction between 2010 and 2020 because it actually grew. Then the pandemic brought it way down, but now it's back up, I think probably higher than, it's probably at new records right now. You can just tell by going back and forth between Davis and Sacramento that the rate of travel is very high. Um, but the target is to reduce the total tra vehicle travel in the state by 2040. And I don't actually know if that's including trucks. I think it's just for light duty vehicles. And there's a whole bunch of programs around that too. People like Susan Handy are very involved in that kind of thing. Okay, the um, sales mandates are a key driver in this state. And what it means is that the CAR, the California Air Resources Board, has set schedules and they keep updating them that the manufacturers and the sellers of vehicles have to reach an average uh, of ZEV zero emission vehicle sales in certain years as a, as a percentage of what they sell. So you've got um, light duty vehicles are gonna have to be 67% by 2030. They, that, that's a, a kind of an approximation, but it's on that order. And the way the crediting system works, it could be a little higher or a little lower, but that's a pretty major, you know, in seven years, um, it's going to look real different around here. Two thirds of the vehicles sold have to be Zevs if they can pull it off. Nobody has to buy one. It's just the sellers have to figure out how to sell them. And there are programs like the California, um, uh, what's it called, the CBRP, the Clean Vehicle Rebate Program that have incentives and now there's new national incentives to buy ZEVs. And I'll mention, I'm going to come back to this in a big way in a minute, but when we talk about ZEVs, there's really only two, well maybe three kinds. There's the battery electric vehicles, there's plug-in hybrid vehicles, and there's fuel cells running on hydrogen. Nothing else counts as a ZEV. So it's going to have to be some combination of these things. Transit buses have to be 100% by 2029, and the transit agencies are running and running around a lot right now trying to figure out how they're going to do it. it it's very real for them. They have to be 50% by 2025. Uh, truck types it's, are in this schedule here, but most of them are going to have to be 30% or more by 2030 and 40% or more by 2035. And I think that'll end up getting tightened. Probably it'll be 100% by 2040 as well. That's not on the books yet. And then drayage, which is a kind of truck that serves ports, is faster. They're going to have to be 100% stocks uh, in the ports by 2035. So when you look at this figure, um, you've got smallish uh, trucks. These are like heavy duty pickups and vans. So your Ford F 250s or F 350s and uh, various kinds of commercial vans. Then you've got your delivery trucks, box trucks, and also some kinds of vocational trucks that have special uses. And then these are your big big rigs, tractor trailers. The middle group, the deliveries have to be at 50% by 2030. The other ones have to be at 30. But this is a revolution. I mean, there's no other place in the world that's telling manufacturers of trucks that they have to build this. Not yet. 
it's probably coming. And Californians, including me, are kind of running around out there telling all these other governments, this is a good idea, you should do this. Because partly because we need to, and partly because the more places that do this, the bigger the markets are going to get, and the more manufacturers are going to get involved, and hopefully all the costs will come down. So that's the, the story there in terms of some of these regs. And I'll pause if there's any questions about any of that before I get into talking about fuel cells and hydrogen. Uh, let's see. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. So you said something about reducing miles traveled by 40%. Or uh -huh. like, how, like, how do you, what, what does that mean? I'm like, going to, I'm going to say, I'm not answering that. Okay. <laughs> it's just not the topic today, but it's a big, it's a big issue. Big question. How do you, how do you get people to drive less? Um, do the, these mandates fall into the, the EPA waiver that CARB has to regulate, or is it, it's, it falls under that waiver, right? It's, I think, yeah. A, yeah, everything here is based on the waiver. So there, in the Clean Air Act, um, there's a waiver that allows California to set its own emissions-related rules, as long as they're stricter than federal rules, because California has the two worst air quality districts in the country. And so the, one of the key drivers for all this is air quality. And zero emission vehicles means no pollutant emissions as well as no CO2 emissions from the vehicle. Uh, so, but that waiver was suspended by the last administration and could, that could happen. Uh, okay, so. Uh, I'd like, yeah. uh, yeah. like to ask uh, these mandates, do they only apply to sales? Like, so mm -hmm. the people who are buying, who are selling only to them or, or the manufacturers? No, no, uh, this is all related to the manufacturers. Actually, I didn't mention, I should have. There's also uh, a rule in the process of being set by ARB that would require fleets to buy the clean, the advanced clean fleet rule is kind of aligned with this set of targets here. This is for manufacturers, but the fleets would actually, large fleets would have to buy in something like this uh, percentage with some adjustments. And that also would be the first time that I know of in the world that a government tells commercial fleets what they have to buy. So interesting. But you know, if, in the case of, of trucks, especially if you're telling manufacturers to build them, you got to make sure there's a market. Whereas with households, somehow it seems like word of mouth might get the job done. Hard to tell. So just in case. Anyone isn't too familiar with a fuel cell vehicle, I'm not going to spend, I'm not an engineer, so I, I kind of get this, but uh, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. Um, but it's an electric vehicle, it's got an electric motor and things like power control unit. Um, sometimes they nowadays with electric vehicles or fuel cells, they put four motors or two or four motors at the wheels, or there might be one central motor that's connected to the wheels. The big difference between a fuel cell vehicle and a battery electric vehicle is that we're storing the energy on the vehicle as hydrogen. So it's compressed hydrogen. You can either compress it to uh, 350 or 700 bar. It's a lot of pressure. Um, and I think cars are probably eventually going to go 700 bar so that they get more range. A 700 bar pressure uh, cylinder or a couple of cylinders should easily allow us to have vehicles that can travel 500 miles on one refueling of hydrogen. Whereas we're gonna have a really hard time doing that with electric vehicles. We might, we're at three to 400. It is possible, but you need so many batteries, so many kilowatt hours of batteries on that vehicle to think about 500 that it, it's just getting to be impractical. Not to mention that with hydrogen uh, vehicles, you can refuel these in 10 to 15 minutes. And if you had liquid uh, stations, with vaporization going in, into these gaseous tanks, you can do it even faster. If you're going from gaseous to gaseous with pressurization, it takes a little longer, but someday this might be a five minute fill and that makes it pretty much identical to a gasoline or diesel vehicle from the consumer point of view. And that is the reason why this is even a thing, okay? It's because it's, it could be very similar to owning a gasoline vehicle in terms of your experience with the car. Not to mention that because it's a motor, the performance is terrific. And there are two or three, there are three uh, models out there right now, Toyota, Honda, and Hyundai, although Honda has suspended production for the moment. But a number of people around IPS and maybe around, you know, Davis have had uh, Toyota Mirai's and they're generally very happy with the car. And it's a high performance car in the sense that the acceleration is excellent. 
it, just like any electric vehicle, like a Tesla almost. The Teslas are pretty overpowered, but any of those electric vehicles do very well on the road. So that's the story. Um, and of course, since it's hydrogen, what you're doing is oh, the fuel cell itself is using membranes to take that hydrogen, combine it with oxygen, and that generates electricity. And that's where your electricity comes from. And that's all I know about that. I don't know anything about that <laughs> process, but but it does mean that there's a, somewhere in the back of the car that water vapor comes out. So that is the emission. But luckily, water at, at ground level is not a greenhouse gas, and it's certainly not air pollutant. Okay, any anything on that? All right. So those were some of the reasons why we might want fuel cell vehicles. There's faster fueling, longer range. Uh, and also, I would say range penalties are less problematic. Um, you know, I was just reading an article about a review of one of the battery electric trucks on the market, uh, pickup trucks, and the review was pretty scathing because he took it from somewhere in California to somewhere else in California through some hills on a hot day, and it only got about half the range it was supposed to get because the actual in-use efficiency dropped dramatically from the air conditioning and from the hills. That could have happened with any kind of car that your efficiency goes down a lot, but it could be a disaster with an electric vehicle if you don't have a place to quick charge and continue your journey, right? Whereas if all you have to do is pull into a fuel station, it's not quite so much of a crisis. So that's part of it. Um, payload is a, is a thing. Uh, a fuel cell truck with long range would tend to be lighter than a battery electric truck with long range because of the weight of the batteries that you need. So the, there's a big concern with battery electric trucks that the weight of the batteries is going to eat into what your payload can be. You're going to lose money from that. Um, and if you build this system, it's a kind of like if you build it, they will come kind of thing for anybody who's ever seen that movie, which is a uh, field of dreams, a baseball movie. If you build it, they will come. Well, if you build a hydrogen system, there's all kinds of users that could step forward to want that hydrogen you got to build this and i'm going to get into that in a minute you got to build that system big enough that you bring the cost of hydrogen down enough that suddenly you attract uh users and that's how markets develop right so that's part of this this is part of an ecosystem or a constellation of things that you're trying to make happen together however there's one really big negative on these vehicles which is the overall efficiency of getting from let's say uh, the electrons coming out of a, a solar panel to moving the vehicle along the road. It's I'll, I, the next slide is about that. The costs of the vehicle are still high. We're not making very many of them, but there's reason to believe this will come down quite a bit. I don't think this is really a deal breaker. Um, because of the efficiency problem and some other reasons, the fuel costs might be a deal breaker, and we got to get those costs down a lot, but they will never really be an advantage compared to electric vehicles. And because in California, everything's gonna to have to either be battery electric or fuel cell, that's the comparison, right? We don't care anymore really, once it's 2030, how this compares to a diesel or something, even if oil prices are through the roof, if battery electric vehicles are much cheaper to operate, they're gonna you know, they're gonna have a huge advantage. Um, and then the chicken or egg problem, this is like those, all through the history of thinking about hydrogen vehicles, it's always been the chicken or egg problem. To me, there's like two chickens and an egg. Um, I was going to kind of, I have to do a paper about that, but two chickens and an egg. But you've got um, the auto manufacturers are chicken, and the uh, infrastructure providers like station builders and others are chicken. Nobody wants to do this when there's no market, and then the consumers are like the egg. You have to crack. Mm -hmm. huh. Oh, uh, no, no, I guess okay. I was. I thought you had mentioned any, any, no, okay. So that's a biggie, and that, that might be very hard to overcome. That's what we're trying to overcome now. Um, okay, so here's where we are. Here's our starting position for fuel cells, and I'll show some of this for hydrogen in a minute. But um, we do have more fuel cell vehicles than anywhere else, almost in the world. Korea's around that number too, but uh, 10,000, this is a logarithmic scale, right? So that's about 15,000, but it isn't changing much. We're only selling about 1,000 a year. And at this point, we're probably losing 1,000 a year. So we're kind of treading water on light duty. This is LDVs. And then there are a few trucks, but notice now we're down under 100 actual units, right? And, and so these don't matter very much. And the amount of uh, hydrogen they use doesn't matter very much either. 
Um, 10,000 kilograms a day may sound, or 15,000 may sound good, but it's, that means 15 tons a day. That's like two or three large refueling stations worth. We have 50 small refueling stations now in the state refueling. So you can find hydrogen, although a lot of times they're not operating. Uh, there's some issues. Sacramento has three. And Davis doesn't have any. And in Sacramento, you're lucky if two out of three are working on a given day. And that's kind of an issue that really has to get solved. I, I'm not tracking that super closely, but there's a plan to roll out another 100 stations in the state with a kind of light duty focus in the next five years and ramp up sales of cars at the same time. That's sort of the light duty strategy. We'll see how that goes. And then there's a truck strategy. Um, here's the problem. Here's one of the big problems. And this is the sort of well to wheels efficiency. And I'm sure that Melissa would have an opinion about this figure, but I don't know, I grabbed it. Um, electric vehicles are incredibly efficient to get from the, the solar rays down to the movement of the vehicle. Like 77% of that energy makes it to moving you along the road. That's, that's like pretty good. And then with some efficiency improvements, these little gold things show you where it could eventually be. So you can get to 80 with some improvements. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is at 33. And that's because First of all, you got to produce the hydrogen. There's a lot of losses there with electrolysis. Um, you got to move it. It's a little bit less efficient than moving electricity. And then on the vehicle, you got to convert it back to electricity. So you lose a bunch more there. So it is a much, much less efficient system. Now, is that a huge problem? Well, it means you've got to have that much, that many more solar panels, right? And if, if the energy is limitless, this isn't such a big problem except if it means it's more expensive, which this part of it definitely means it's gonna be more expensive. If we have limits on land or any other reason, or, or also grid electricity limits, if the grid can't handle moving all these electrons around to get, get us to the hydrogen, then that could be an issue. Although you could make the hydrogen right at the renewable uh, farms and move the hydrogen directly. So that actually kind of does an end run around the electric system, which is interesting part of this. Eventually, this could go up some with, with more efficiency gains, but this also doesn't include if we were to liquefy and then de-liquefy the hydrogen. That's another 10 or 15% loss, maybe more, I don't know, but it's, it, it hurts the numbers <coughs> even more. The best uh, kind of analogy that I've heard about why we shouldn't worry so much about this, we live in a world where consumers are king, they decide what they want, the most efficient way to travel, to this group, this is not a, probably a great argument, okay, but the most efficient way to travel is walking. Second most efficient way to travel is on a bike, and yet very few people do this because they don't want to. They want to be in a car, at least for longer trips, right? So they're choosing an incredibly efficient mode. Don't forget, this is, this is actually power delivery, which is worse, but uh, gasoline vehicles, uh, it, well, it's nowhere near this bad, but it's, you know, it's not great. And of course, it's fossil fuel and all those problems. But people are choosing it because that's what they want. So if people like the experience of driving a car that they can take down to the hydrogen station and refuel it in seven minutes and go on about their day and not have to worry about charging and that sort of thing, then this, I mean, the bottom line is, will the markets choose this technology and will people want and companies want this more than electric? I think there's a chance if it, if it, if it has a chance, if it gets big enough that, you know, it's a real option, then yeah, some share will. But we still could have opinions about whether this is a good idea or not. And a lot of people really don't like this. I mean, there are people who really hate hydrogen because of this. They just don't think we should go there. All right. Um, cost. This uh, slightly confusing chart is different cost per mile of driving, let's say for a car, for a mid-sized car, that's actually probably a small SUV kind of efficiencies. So the on-road efficiency, if it were electric, would be 0.4 kilowatt hours a mile and 50 miles per kg, which is like 50 miles per gallon for fuel cell, 0.4 kilowatt hours is like 80 miles a gallon equivalent. So this is a much more efficient car, the battery electric, which we kind of saw in the last figure, but this is still pretty good, right? 50, pretty good. Um, but if you look at all the costs associated with getting the fuel to the uh, to the vehicle, and then you think about what it means for uh, per mile of driving, 
This is kind of where we are right now. Uh, around 16, 18 cents a mile would be a reasonably efficient car, a uh, gasoline car. That you would get that from this EV even at 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So our home electricity rates in California might be somewhere in the 15 to 20 cent kilowatt hour range. So if you're down in the 20 cent range, you're way cheaper than the gasoline car. Okay, so I can show that too. That's the, the way cheaper current bev situation. So that, that tells you right there that you've cut your driving cost in half. Now, if you're out on the highway or, or around town and you're paying for fast charging, you might easily be paying 40 cents a kilowatt hour, right? Those charges are expensive. I just checked one yesterday in Davis at the Bank of America, there's a few of them, and it said it was 42 cents, at least at that moment. So, okay, so now you're not really doing better than, than the gasoline vehicle. For the fuel cell, the equivalent would be eight cents uh, per kilogram to compete with the gasoline, or you'd have to get it down to four, excuse me, it's eight dollars a kilogram. You'd have to get it down to four dollars a kilogram to compete with the electric vehicle. Right now, the cost of hydrogen and refueling stations in California is around 15. Okay, so we're up here somewhere. I think we can get it to eight without, as the market grows and as production grows and all these systems get bigger. A lot of this is just because it's so small right now. Eight shouldn't be that hard by, let's say, the late 2020s. But that still doesn't get us to competing with household electricity rates. It's still an expensive fuel. I doubt we'll ever get to four. The best we can hope for, DOE says $1 to produce hydrogen is their goal and that we can make it by 2030. I haven't figured out how that happens. But even with really cheap electricity and cheap electrolyzers running all the time, I'm thinking $2 a kilogram to produce it. Then maybe a buck to move it around and store it, which is a lot less than it is right now. And then maybe $2, two to $3 at the station to uh, store it and then refuel vehicles. That's around six. Six is a nice target for 2030 for hydrogen. If you can get to six, you're not doing so bad. You're, you're in the ballpark of electrics. So that's the story on fuel cost. And I think fuel cost is gonna be a big deal. And we have to get from 15 down to at least eight as fast as we can. And maybe some of that has to be subsidies. Um, how does the uh, fuel, called fuel credit in the IRA, uh, three, $3 per kg mm -hmm. subsidy, how does that impact the, I guess, the, the full life cycle? The that'll, that'll help. Um, that is uh, an investment tax credit, but it's right. a maximum of $3 per kg. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, in the best case, if you get you $3 kg, uh, we also have the LCFS that, right. gives, that can give you several dollars a kg. So actually, the LCFS is already in play for any station up to uh, 1,500 kilograms a day, which all the stations are no bigger than that. You, you get credits under the LCFS as if you were selling at your full rate, which actually most stations are only selling at like 25% of what they can sell because the market's not there yet. But they get... To, get the LCMS credits as if they were selling at 100%. That helps us get down to 15, right? And um, so that's already in there, but the, the, the IRA credits will maybe get it down to 12. I mean, again, I think 10 is something that we should hopefully get to within a couple of years. At the moment, it's going the wrong way because of all this inflation and all kinds of other things going on right now that I, I, I'm not, no, it's uh, Iwatani. Iwatani just uh, apparently told customers they were charging 15 and they're going to take it up to 20 something for a little while because they're losing too much money. But um, And then the main fuel cells on the road right now are the uh, Toyota Mirais and Toyota covers your fuel cost for the first, I don't know, how to, it's a, like usually a, typically a two or three year lease and it must be, you know, 10,000 miles a year worth of fuel that they pay for. So it's actually Toyota that's gonna to have to pay those higher prices. But Mark's really messed up right now. We gotta get through that messed up and get to something that's, you know, more uh, stable and bigger and that kind of thing. Okay, well, I don't know if that was optimistic, probably not. But let's look at the hydrogen part of this and the hydrogen system. Oh, no, actually, no, sorry. I do have a few more cost ones, although maybe I shouldn't spend much time on them because we're, I know it's it's already after 11. Um, We've been doing a lot of work, what we call TCO, total cost of ownership, 
and comparing uh, different studies. There are 10 different studies from every, every university and NGO you can imagine on comparing um, hydrogen battery electric and uh, diesel for trucks or gasoline for cars. Although actually most of these studies do not include fuel cells, hydrogen, they're mostly about battery electric. And then we've done our own that of course is the best and it's, it's out there. And now we're, now we're, at least we're not total outliers. There's some studies, some students say, how, how did they get that number? It's like way up there. You know? um, and now we're taking the next step to think about what we call choice modeling, kind of thing David Bunch is well known for, um, where the thing about TCO, the total cost of ownership, which means the cost of buying your vehicle, the cost of the fuel, and maybe the cost of maintaining it. You know, um, there's a, a nice uh, website that AAA, the American Automobile Association, manages that shows every year the average cost of owning a car in this country. And it's been going up a lot. It's up around $9,000 a year to own a car. So that would be your payments on, on buying it your um, insurance, your maintenance, you know, the tax, the registration tax, stuff like that. that. Those are all important, but what we really want to get at is what about all the non-cost things? What about, especially if it's a choice between a fuel cell and a battery electric, it's stuff I was saying earlier, um, the range, the recharge or refueling time, the payload of its trucks, how do you factor these in in terms of the way people are making choices? And actually, I don't have slides on this today because we're, we we did a uh, webinar on, on it with our sponsors a couple of days ago, and we're we're getting there. But I think this will be interesting because I think for fuel cells, the advantages are mostly non-cost advantages that they just maybe will perform better than electric vehicles. Um, but here's a little of the TCO stuff, and here's where. We've got that hydrogen coming down. We say seven. We're a little. I'd say a little conservative. Uh, there's hope that it will be better than this by 2030. And I mentioned it's 15 and maybe going the wrong way right now. But then we say five by 2040. But maybe if we push hard enough, we could make it to five closer to 2030. And then you've got a bunch of the cost of batteries has come down a lot. We think it will still come down, which makes it that much tougher for fuel cells. Fuel cell system costs for the stack and all the, all the components is around 500. It used to be over 1,000. But with scale up, it should be down under. It's not that different looking. I mean, this is kilowatt hours, this is kilowatts. But the two critical components for each of these vehicles is going to get a lot cheaper. I mean, there's a lot, lot more cost reductions out there to get. Yeah. You, you always say, have a question. Yeah, I'll okay. say it. I'll okay. Say it. Sorry. sorry. We've got a cheap electricity cost here, and we do a version where we say, well, if you did half your charging with fast chargers, of course, if you believe it's 40, then this goes way up. Um, and then we had diesel fuel uh, staying around 450, which even though in California now it's like 550. Uh, this is kind of a US level analysis. And 450 is high enough that we start throwing politicians out of office. <laughs> um, so what it means is if you compare Different, this is just trucks. We didn't put cars in this one. Different kinds of trucks. Um, and you look at, look, if you just keep that diesel, because it doesn't change anyway. And then you look at them. This is the purchase. This is just the purchase part of the vehicle 2030, 2020, 2030, 40. And the blue ones are fuel cells 2020, 2030, 2040. It's kind of interesting. It's a lot here. But if I just focus here, so for a long haul truck, this is your 500 mile truck, this is one of the best cases for fuel cells. Um, right now, they're they're both expensive. This is these are the 2020. Or they you know they were they're getting cheaper even off of this numbers. But by 2030, we think they can be down here. And notice that the fuel cell is a lot cheaper than the battery electric because it doesn't have to have all those batteries, and the fuel cell system has gotten a lot cheaper. Um, it is competitive with uh, well, it's getting close to competitive with the diesel truck, uh, and it stays it has a slight advantage compared to electric even in 2040. In a shorter haul truck, it's much closer, right? These, these are all a lot closer. And by 2040, it's a wash. So this in this case, with a shorter distance long haul truck, that cost advantage isn't such a big deal. And if companies decide, well, we can live with 300 mile trucks and we'll maybe, I mean, you may have to have more trucks, which is a, a cost, but you might be able to jigger around how you do your logistics and, and, and pull this off, then 
So, you know, it, it's, it's really here where you see the big advantage of fuel cells. Um, this one is the TCO. This is the first cost plus the electricity or hydrogen cost plus maintenance. We actually have maintenance in there. Fuel cells probably going to take a little more maintenance money than electrics, but not a lot more. And they're both better than diesels because the diesel engines take a lot of, um, or gasoline engines take a lot of maintenance that the motors don't take. Um, and fuel cell systems are surprisingly reliable. The, the most, uh, the longest duration fuel cells so far are in buses around the state. The state has about 60 or 70 fuel cell buses in operation. Some of them are six or seven years old. Very reliable. They're, they're, it's, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are like, okay, we can do this. Uh, and that's all kinds of stop and go traffic and that sort of thing. So looking at TCO, if we do the, oops, oh, you know what? I didn't get my little dots in on this one. Um, Looking at long hauls again, it's a different story, right? In 2030, for battery electrics, it's cheaper than the fuel cells because the electricity costs are so much lower. So that is part of the story, that even though fuel cells might be cheaper to buy, they're not cheaper to operate. And that, that's going to be an issue. Um, OK, so that's the end of that kind of part of my talk. Now I am going to talk more about hydrogen. We have a big study that our group has been working on now for a year and a half. And it also occasionally includes people from the Energy Efficiency Institute like Kelly Kissick and um, some of, a couple of their students have been involved. But it's been mostly about transportation. And if you start with a kind of transportation demand picture for hydrogen, what might the system look like? And it's kind of a devilishly complicated question that we've now got three models that we've developed to try to address this kind of question. We put out a few smaller papers and then one modeling paper from May, and then we're going to do a revised version of this as an ITS report, hopefully in January. Um, but that's on the website. You can always look at that and get a good sense of what we're doing. Um, and we're trying to answer these questions. <clears throat> How big could the hydrogen market in California become? See, we are going beyond transportation to try to answer that in some way. Um, and how can hydrogen be best supplied to a large system? How can the system transition from, okay, gray to blue to green hydrogen? Who, who's heard of these colors for hydrogen? Okay, pretty good. A lot of people don't like those colors because they're vague and it's better to just say what it is, but basically gray means fossil. Blue means fossil with CCS, natural gas basically with CCS using steam methane reforming. And then green would either be electrolytic hydrogen, but it should be from renewable electricity, which we don't completely have right now. We kind of gloss over that part. Or um, from biomass. So for example, if you start gathering up all the forest waste, you can gasify it to make hydrogen. And we're not really doing that, but we could. A little expensive, but it's a very interesting possibility. The problem with gasifying biomass or, or anything else you do, like using dairy, uh, methane, or uh, landfill gas to make hydrogen is we're already talking about using it for five other things. So there's a real question about whether there's enough of this stuff to really matter and how we're going to use it. And there have been some good studies on that. And actually, the one by uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, about two years ago came to the conclusion that hydrogen is one of your very best ways to use that biomass. So that was interesting. Um, so anyway, green is what we're focused on, which are those renewable-based hydrogen. And we're trying to understand how, what it's going to take to get down a green path. And you know, I don't have a slide about arches, so I'm going to stop and just tell you for a minute that uh, a little bit of a backstory. There's an office of uh, hydrogen fuel cells at the Department of Energy. Um, they've been researching this stuff forever. They've been pushing very hard to commercialize things in the last few years. And then in not the most recent, oh, yeah. Uh, when you say uh, biomass, you also mean like landfill yep. emissions and, and waste water? Well, if you have landfill methane, you might as well capture it, right? That's one of your best things you can do. And then you can either use it as methane or you can pull the hydrogen off of it and do something else with the carbon. The wastewater treatment plants. Yeah. But there's just not that much of that stuff, right? It's really tiny compared to a big scenario like I'm going to show you. That's the problem. Um, so now in the last, not in the most recent law, uh, the, but the one right 
before a year ago, it's called the IRJA, the infrastructure law. There is uh, around $10 billion for building hydrogen hubs in the United States. So one question is, what's a hydrogen hub? I don't think anybody really knows yet, but it, it kind of is being taken to mean like a statewide hydrogen system, or maybe a multi-state hydrogen system. And DOE has a map where they, you know, kind of conceptualize that there could be like 10 hydrogen hubs around the country, like in the Northwest, in the Northeast, in the Louisiana area. But one of them is California, and it's the only one that's just a single state in their picture. And so now they're, uh, they've just issued the request for proposals to apply to become a hydrogen hub, and they're going to fund up to eight places to create a hydrogen hub. And so those um, proposals are due Monday. They're concept papers. They're 20 pages. They're very vague. I've been involved in, in the one we're doing in California. I feel somewhat confident that we will get one. But at the beginning, all they do is give you a uh, encourage or discourage for you to do a full application. And the full applications are due in April. I know. And even if they discourage you, you can do one. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably for fun because if they discourage you, that's not a good sign, right? And so based on the 20 pages, you're gonna get sort of a green or a yellow light. Um, and I can't talk about it much, but I can say that um, we're, you know, trying to envision what a hydrogen system in the state could look like 2030 and then beyond. We're trying to say something about how DOE funds would be used. Each hub can get up to $1.25 billion. It's not chunk change, although you can also easily imagine a hydrogen system by 2030 that costs 20 or $30 billion. So now that $1 billion doesn't look like so much money, but it might be critical for some parts of the system, that kind of thing. So that's coming. And our group, the, the um, proposals have to come from public-private partnerships. And ours is called ARCHES, which is the, um, oh boy. I can't remember. Uh, the R is renewable. Oh, it's the Alliance for Clean Renewable. Uh, C means something. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, renewable clean hydrogen. And then there's a little two in the arches name, there's only two after the H, and then some other letters. But the point is, it's renewable. We're going to do a renewable hub. We don't think any other place in the country is going to target a renewable hub. We don't tax the system. It's just going to be like, well, we got a lot of. You know, refineries and chemical plants are going to connect them with hydrogen. You know, that's what we figure they're going to say. They'll, they'll probably, they have a lot of wind in Texas. They probably will have a lot of renewable, but it won't be exclusively renewable. So we're probably going to go all in. And that is kind of off the record because uh, I think because the name includes renewable, I think it's, a, it's public knowledge that that's the goal. That's the angle we're taking. But um, we'll see how, how much that resonates. I hope it really resonates a lot that we're, because it's still cheaper to produce hydrogen from natural gas with reforming than from electricity or biomass. You know, for biomass, you'd still probably use reforming to get your hydrogen, I think. But from electricity, you're going to use uh, electrolysis, and it's a totally different technology, and it's very expensive. But we're hoping it gets cheaper. Okay. So, um, how can how can hydrogen help manage both gas and electricity grids in California? This is one of the big questions with hydrogen that people are very interested in. You can imagine hydrogen, well, at least as a transition strategy, being blended into natural gas and carried through pipelines as a blend. So you're slowly decarbonizing and lowering the amount of natural gas and replacing it with hydrogen. And it would mean if you just stuck it in pipelines that that blend is gonna be used by whatever is at the other end of that pipeline, right? So your stove suddenly could be 10% hydrogen. Uh, or the power plants that get hydrogen could be 10% hydrogen. So you got to make sure your end use equipment can handle it. So that's kind of a key thing. And most of it seems like it's fine up to maybe 15 and 20%. The other problem, and Joan Ogden actually called this out very well in a couple of papers, because hydrogen is a lot lower uh, energy per unit volume than natural gas, you're lowering the amount of energy you're moving in the pipeline. And above about 15%, it gets really to be a bit of a problem. And so, um, at some point, you just figure, let's just build natural gas pipelines. I mean, excuse me, hydrogen pipelines and not worry about blending anymore. But I think blending is going to be a thing, and maybe especially for turbines, peaker units, 
for uh, power plants, they can actually blend it right at that unit. They don't have to put it in the pipeline if they have the hydrogen nearby. And it, it's uh, most of the turbines right now can do up to 30% or more. And then there's already some of the, uh, like uh, Southern California Edison, I guess, or maybe it's San Diego Gas Electric. I can't remember. One of them already has uh, a plan to retrofit a bunch of their peaker units to be 100% hydrogen capable. So I think that that would be an important part of this. So what happens if you do all this? What are the costs and benefits? And I mentioned the cost could be in the tens of billions. Um, it's harder to measure the benefits. And I think with transportation, one of the problems is you get most of those benefits from electric vehicles. If you compare it to diesel, you get huge CO2 and uh, pollutant reduction benefits, but you're gonna get those anyway from electric vehicles. So a lot of times when you're measuring this stuff, it's about what you compare it to, right? And if, if you're gonna be honest in a state where we have to have eventually either electric or hydrogen, then it probably isn't very, you know, it's a little bit disingenuous to compare everything only to diesel or gasoline. Um, and what policies would we need to make all this happen? And we may have quite a few of them, but one very noticeable thing about the California way of doing policies for ZEVs, for zero emission vehicles, they try to be technology neutral. Everything's about ZEVs without saying it's going to be an electric or a fuel cell hydrogen Z. And so it's sort of up to the markets to decide. But you got to have infrastructure and you can't, there's nothing technology neutral about building infrastructure. It's going to have to either be chargers or a hydrogen station, right? I mean, you can have tax credits so you can go one or the other, but ultimately we need probably a fair bit of direct investment into specific infrastructure. And we're starting to get that. And then there could be other things. I mean, of course, with hydrogen, there's all kinds of questions about um, uh, cogent standards and there's still a lot of places hydrogen vehicles are not, aren't allowed to drive and, and things like that. Although that's getting better quickly, I think, in most in many places now. And I don't pay that much attention to that. I assume all that stuff gets solved. So, okay. Um, moving right along here. Um, so we started modeling this about a year ago. Uh, well, we had models already, but we, connected them better and we uh, kind of built, built them and modified them for the questions we're trying to answer in this study. And we created two scenarios that underlie the whole thing that are simply, if you had some hydrogen fuel cell cars and trucks, and the other one is if you had a whole lot of hydrogen fuel cell cars and trucks going out to 2050 to just see what it looks like on the roads, to be able to see something about how much infrastructure we need for that, including the stations and, and other things, and then um, what it means for how much hydrogen we're demanding spatially and how we can provide it. So we're trying to do the whole study at some level of spatial detail for California. Uh, we did also include, like I said, some non-transportation end uses, and I'll show one slide that has some of that. It looks to me like if you want big numbers by 2030, transportation is the way to go. It's just going to be tough. A good example of a potentially big in, in industry use of hydrogen is making ammonia. And you make ammonia, you, you, could, you could just sell it somewhere. You could put it on a ship and, and export it. But very toxic. I don't know how good I, idea it is to truck it all over the place. But if you made it near a fertilizer plant or at a fertilizer plant, now you because ammonia is the key input for making fertilizer, which is happening all over the country, but not in California. And we use an amazing amount of fertilizer in the state. So let's build one or two fertilizer plants here with ammonia and make the ammonia uh, with renewable hydrogen. But there's some talk of it. But by the time someone got serious about it and built it, it's 2030, easy. Whereas transportation might happen a little faster. So it, it's hard to imagine a huge amount of industry hydrogen adoption before 2030. The one caveat being uh, refineries, which already use an enormous amount of hydrogen, but they make all their own hydrogen. So it's not really something that they trade. It's not really going to be part of the trade big system unless they decide that they wanted to sell it. Uh, and then the caveat to that is two refineries, two companies that have refineries have announced either, well, the intention, let's say, of 
converting those refineries to be bio refineries. And for example, Phillips 66 has the Rodeo refinery in uh, Vallejo, I think it's in Vallejo, that um, they will convert to make only renewable diesel and maybe some uh, renewable jet fuel. And it's going to take, it takes, a, I don't know what it is, 30% more hydrogen per per gallon of fuel for that than it would for making regular diesel. But they're going to have to increase their hydrogen use. They'll probably at least start by just producing even more. They have uh, companies that produce the hydrogen for them on site at the refinery using natural gas. They'll probably just keep ramping that up. So it doesn't play into the idea of building a bigger system. But they indicate they would like to make renewable hydrogen, and they might even want to sell it. So then it becomes possibly part of a bigger system. All right. Um, so the modeling system is a little wonky here. This is actually kind of simplified, but it's got these, these kind of components. Um, here we have travel module, and that is our spatial, it's called Steve. We didn't put the names of the models on here, but it's called Steve, but it's S T I E V E. So it's easy to differentiate from other Steve's. Uh, and, and that um, is a uh, statewide travel demand model that has where all the cars and trucks go. It's got origins and destinations. We just basically, we use the uh, actually the California statewide travel demand model to calibrate to, and it says where they think all the vehicles are going to go in the future and how many there will be. And then all we do is say, well, what if 10% of them are fuel cell by this date and 20% are fuel cell by that date? And then kind of put that into the mix. We also look a little bit at fuel cell vehicles, trucks that would return to base and might refuel in a certain location. And so that's given us that kind of a picture of how it would play around the state. It also gives us a basis for saying where they drive and where their emissions are and how, if they convert to hydrogen, it might uh, cut emissions in critical places like disadvantaged communities. Mm -hmm. uh, for that model to do, uh, take into account like different adoption rates of hydrogen vehicles in different neighborhoods. Because I know like, you know, Imperial County might not be the best place versus like San Francisco County. Yeah. Um, we, we have that only for a few years. We do have, we start with where the vehicles are, the 15,000 that are out there. And that tends to be the case. They're all in certain neighborhoods in LA or in San Francisco. But eventually they're gonna have to, you know, go bigger, right? They're gonna have to kind of be everywhere eventually. Um, and then the second model, is a supply distribution model. It's, it's basically a supply chain model. If you know where your hydrogen demands are, where are you gonna make it? How are you gonna get it to the demand nodes? And for that, we use a model that NREL developed called SARA, and we work with NREL and run that model. And uh, it's it's very interesting to, and I'll show you some of that if I have time. I'm gonna run out of time before I get to any results. But I want, I, I normally should wait a stop so that I take questions, but hopefully we're getting enough questions as we go that that's not so critical. Um, so the infrastructure part of this, how do we build it out? And then the last part is using Alan Jen's uh, electric sector uh, generation demand model, dispatch model um, called Good. So we have Steve, Sarah, and Good. Um, and it is a national electric sector model, but we're just looking at the western half of the U.S. and saying if you were going to produce electricity under different scenarios in the western half of the U.S. and you have a certain demand growth anyway from everything else and all the demand you might get from electric vehicles, what if you make some of them hydrogen, what happens? And that's pretty interesting. So that's all ongoing, but I have some sense of, uh, oh yeah, and then there's an air quality model associated with the whole thing based on where the emissions happen. And we compare vehicle emissions and reduction in vehicle emissions from these, from both fuel cells and electrics to any increases in emissions you might have from more electricity generation, which of course only happens if there's still fossil in the system. And other Western states are not necessarily decarbonized in the way California. So there is, depending on the scenario, there could be quite a bit of emissions at least outside the state. Um, okay, there's a lot of stuff. There's a fire hose. I don't want to, you know, is there any other questions right now? Then I'll, I'll talk a little about these demand scenarios. Hey. I have a yep. Yep. So backtracking to one of your early slides about adopting um, fuel cell hydrogen for in terms of like long haul trucking, do you foresee any loopholes with interstate commerce in that gameplay? 
Well, whether I don't know about exactly what happens with interstate commerce clause and that sort of thing, but certainly if you're a long haul truck and you refuel with hydrogen, you're a fuel cell truck and you leave the state and there are no other fueling stations in the other states, then you know that ain't going to work too well. So one of the things DOE is, I think, going to do with this hydrogen hubs thing is also try to figure out how to have a highway system uh, to refuel highway vehicles or anybody on highway. I mean, of course, if you're traveling from state to state, you're going to be on highway systems. So even if Vegas doesn't have any hydrogen. Maybe there's a station on the highway leading to. Well, in the case of Vegas, you could probably stick one right on the border on the California side, and that might be enough to get to Vegas and back out again. Certainly would, even for trucks, but that's not a good solution. And it's ironic that back in 2007 or something, um, Governor Arnie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, was keen on hydrogen. He had a hydrogen hopper. That was interesting. So the least efficient you could possibly be with hydrogen. <laughs> and uh, he and his team came up with the idea of a hydrogen highway. And they actually uh, built, I don't know what it was, maybe 10 hydrogen stations around highways in California. They never had used very much. It was a little before its time. And then the thinking evolved to be, let's do neighborhoods where people are more likely to buy the vehicles and make sure you can at least drive regionally and then get to the highway. We don't even have that much highway coverage yet, even after six years of that strategy. So it's it's possible to drive from LA to San Francisco with your hydrogen vehicle. You would probably need one ref refill, and there's I think only maybe only one or possibly two, like maybe one on I five and one on ninety nine. But we need a lot more stations. So this is my latest way of thinking about how you might uh, grow this thing for vehicles and vehicle demand of hydrogen. And it's based on very much on the fact that California is going to require the sales of zero emission vehicles. So you look at what is the sales share of ZEVs for all, and this, this example is light duty, so it's cars. And then, and then the, the part that's like a heroic assumption is what percentage of the ZEVs would be fuel cell. But if you multiply those two numbers together, it's not very big for a while. So in this case, for 2027, um, oh no, I'm sorry, it's got light duty, it's got everything else I'm forgetting. Um, the light duties have to be, um, let's see. Okay, the actual share of ZEVs isn't on here. Sorry, I, I, I've used older ones, the newer ones have it. But we know that by 2027, ZEVs are going to have to be something like a third of all vehicles sold. I only assume a tiny share of that 33% is uh, hydrogen, okay, or fuel cell, because even that tiny percentage ends up being enough fuel cell vehicles that it's way more than what's happening right now. So it's something like, um, you know, 15 or 20,000 vehicles a year by 2027, whereas we're only selling 1,000 vehicles a year right now. So this is more than you might think. But for other ones like transit buses, we know we're going to be at close to 100% ZEVs by 2027. And we're saying a third of them would be uh, fuel cell. So the fuel cells then are 25% of all the new buses. And then if the yellow ones are stock, so as the stock turns over, you still only be at about 8% of the buses are fuel cell in the state. There's about 12,000 buses in the state. So that means 1,000 fuel cell buses. And I mentioned right now there's 70. So that's still a big push for 2027. So this is a rapid growth scenario, but it's not that many vehicles yet by 2027. By 2030, it's beginning to change. Um, I'm, we're up to 40% market share of the ZEBs are fuel cells for some of them, and 33 for others. And we're up to 5%, I think it is, for light duty. And I really should have put the, the stock numbers on here, but it, it's... Um, it's getting into at least 100,000 or more, maybe 150,000 light duty fuel cell vehicles, again, compared to 15,000 right now. This is rapid growth. You've got to align your refueling infrastructure. You've got to get people interested in buying these things. You've got to have the manufacturers making enough of them, and you've got to have the fuel. So this is really what the hydrogen hub is for. It's to coordinate this, to have this kind of a vision, and we'll see what is actually, we, we won't know this level of detail for what the hub is really proposing for California until April. When, when the hub submits its bigger uh, proposal, and I don't know when these things become public, but 
we'll see if I can convince people that we should do this. It might be less ambitious than this, but we'll see. Um, here's 2035, it keeps growing. And by 2050, which I didn't show, um, it, it, it kind of levels off here. It's like 50% of ZEVs are, are assumed to be fuel cell for uh, transit buses in the long haul. The transit bus operators like fuel cells a lot, even though they're more expensive right now. And to, talking to them, I think it's reasonable to think half of sales will eventually be fuel cell. And then um, for other trucks, I'm stopping at a 40% market share. And for cars, it's, it's, it actually goes up to 10. So we're at 10, by 2040, it's 10% of ZEVs. So 90% BEVs. 10% uh, fuel cells, and you get this kind of a picture. Um, there's way, way more light duty vehicles sold in any state or any country than trucks. So this is a little misleading because um, this number here that by 2036 would be 160,000 fuel cell car sales is out of a market of 1.5 million, or sometimes as high as 2 million a year. So it's this is the um, getting close to 10% kind of number of the market. I guess that is probably 10% is what we're assuming. So that, that's not a huge number compared to how many vehicles get sold, but you can see the growth right here, pretty rapid. And then if you do this without the light duty, the other ones get bigger. Uh, the next biggest is uh, class four to seven delivery vehicles, and then you've got all these other ones. Long haul is critical, not because there are so many units. This is your tractor trailers, uh, and also class sevens, which are connected, but can ha handle up to 30 tons or something. Um, but especially the long hauls use so much fuel, right? They're traveling three or four times more per day than any other kind of vehicle. And these things can travel 800 miles a day. Um, sometimes they have two drivers taking turns so that they can drive, you know, 16 hours a day. Um, and they can, you can build an entire hybrid system off of these vehicles, although it's going to all be high, uh, highway refueling. Okay, so that's the scenario. Um, there's a stock picture. Let me just quickly. So the hydrogen from this. Here's where we are now. Not much. Um, here's where we are in 2035. So 3,500 tons per day, and then probably the, this is something we all need to learn. You can put numbers up, but if people don't know what the numbers mean, that that's you know you got to explain your numbers, right? So that is more that is twice as much as the amount of hydrogen that refining uses right now. And refining uses quite a lot of hydrogen. So now we're into the big leaks. This is uh, transportation would be a pretty major user of hydrogen, and that's with those fairly conservative numbers about how quickly fuel cells are growing. So trying to get on that path and and Providing for that is going to be really challenging. And that's probably the most important figure that will come out of our study. I think that this is what we're talking about. And by 2030, it's only here, right? So it's really, that's that even that's steep, but a thousand is probably a lot easier than, than 4,000. But one way to think of it is stations. Is that the next slide? Uh, no, somewhere I've got a slide about stations that you want to jump to. Um, a thousand tons a day by 2030 would be enough to support 20 production facilities of 50 tons a day. Now, 50 tons a day is considered pretty big. Um, it's not the biggest. There are ones in Texas using SMR that are bigger, but for an electrolysis plant, that'd be a pretty big plant. And it should give us all those economies of scale that we want, right? You, you, you're big, you're, and hopefully you're at high capacity factor and you're bringing that cost down. We could have 20 of those somewhere, either in the state or maybe outside the state, you're probably going to want to put renewable farms near them, uh, provide as much of that electricity directly to your uh, electrolyzers as you can without dealing with the grid, not only because of what I mentioned about grid congestion, but because uh, you have to pay grid prices if you're taking your electricity off the grid. And even the industrial rates are something like 12 cents. 10 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. If you want cheap hydrogen, you got to be down around one or two cents a kilowatt hour. You've got to have that cheap wind farm or solar farm and draw directly from, like own it and draw directly from it and be paying yourself, you know, one cent or two cents for that electricity. So that's the big incentive there. Um, and then there's drawbacks of doing that. But uh, anyway, so that's the kind of system that we'd be talking about. 2030 is only seven years away. 
So there's reason to think this might be possible, but still take longer. The problem is the longer it takes, the more we're hanging in the that what we call the valley of death, where nobody's making any money, um, things aren't big enough yet, and people go bankrupt, right? I mean, the truck companies that are actually now starting to gear up, like Nikola and Hyzon and Hyundai, they want to sell a thousand trucks a year. They'd like to, now they're willing to, they're, they're happy to sell them all over the country. They don't only have to sell them in California, but they're really counting on California. Like for so many things, people look to California for leadership here, and they're hoping that our market grows fast and that maybe with the hydrogen hubs, other markets come along pretty quickly. But if nothing much happens for the next four or five years, these companies are going to struggle. Same thing if you build fueling stations, you got to sell the fuel. So we want it to go fast. So um, that that's some more of that stuff, and I'm going to kind of skip some things, but I'll come back to this one. This is the same thing if you, it's just for 2030. I had mentioned there's a low case. So this, this low case could end up being closer to what really happens. But um, actually, actually, this whole thing is, is lower because I mentioned uh, 1,000 tons. But it's per year. No, this is right. This is, this is like 1,000 tons a day uh, of transportation because if you multiply a day by 365, you get a year. So 350,000 tons a year is like 1,000 tons a day. And in our modeling, we find that our best, you know, if we grow the way I'll show you how you grow, you're, you're here. Everything we've come up with for the industrial side, working with EEI and, and others, um, it's about a third or not even 30% of, of what we're getting out of transportation. And that's in the high case. Actually, it's a little higher percentage in the low case. Um, and that assumes the refineries somehow, you know, contribute not just isolated from the rest of the system, but as part of the system. And the niche of bio refineries are very important. And we have more of them in the low case. Anybody know why? Why would we have more hydrogen here in the low case than the high case? Well, it's not, it's not obvious. It's because we're making a, an assumption which may or may not make sense that in the high case, we're transitioning away from oil so fast that there's not that much market for them. And they're not going to be investing in these refineries. Some of them are going to shut down. They might still produce and send it out of the state if there's not as big a market in the state. But that's the story there. I think people are burning out. Um, I might just kind of stop there. Um, I can come back for part two some other time. But any any other questions? Because we have to stop at eleven twenty-five. Is that right? Eleven fifteen. Okay. So let's take more questions. Yep. Yeah. Every time I think about hydrogen, I go jump to the same conclusion, but maybe I'm missing something here. And maybe it's not such a good idea. But um, one of the main problems with renewables, I mean, especially solar and wind right now, is the lack of uh, industrial scale or utility scale storage. Oh, yeah. So would there be an opportunity to, instead of storing it into batteries, just using the excess energy at certain points, making hydrogen, and then converting it back to electricity whenever we need it? Kind of yep. Instead of curtailing, instead of using, and I mean, it seems like a simpler technology, you just need a literally a storage tank that we've been using for a million. Yeah, like 30 slides <laughs> <years. laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. Um, that's one of those like other good things about hydrogen. And it's not clear how much it would help you, let's say, for your transportation side use of hydrogen. But this is busy. Um, but let me just say that. I think this one's better. Well, what we've got here is hydrogen storage. So this is from that good model, the electric sector. And if you had a system that's all electric vehicles, so this is um, actually uh, the electricity generated that relates to vehicles. You would, um, let's see if I got this right. Um, you actually would use a lot of hydrogen in this system if you are able to, if, if the electric utilities embrace hydrogen as a storage. So the idea is you've got, and I'm not showing it, but we've got all kinds of 
outputs that are day to day, and you've got some days that are high demand for electricity, some days are low, and it's very seasonal, right? But we know this is a big problem that you've got uh, peak demand maybe in the summer and, and low demand in the winter, and then there's day night. So if you start using hydrogen to store the energy, and then you would regenerate the electricity with hydrogen, probably, like I mentioned for a while, it'd be with turbines, eventually, it might be with fuel cells. You're storing a lot of hydrogen by these dates, this is 2045 and 2050, when the system is really getting into very high percentages of renewables. And that is all related to energy storage within the system. Interestingly, and we're still exploring this, this one, that's for 100% BEV uh, transportation system by 2045. This one is mixed, and that is the kind of hydrogen vehicle system that I mentioned mixed with battery electric. So maybe a third of the vehicles by 2045 are hydrogen and two thirds are electric. The need to store hydrogen goes down, which I think is really odd. I mean, this doesn't include hydrogen for end use, but within the electric system, it goes down because, again, I'm trying to fully understand this. It's actually pretty new as well. Um, you can use the, the transportation sector to siphon off all that extra high electric extra capacity yeah. that you were going to curtail. And you don't actually need to store it as much in the system. Yeah. So the hydrogen vehicles let you get away with less storage. It's kind of weird, but that's but it's interesting. So yeah, these kinds of things are, are important. And it's a lot of lot of dollars here that you can benefit from that. So, so it's not a bad idea. That part is, that part is not a bad idea at all. If it is a competitive way to store energy and it seems to be uh, at least <laughs> And longer basis. Just like a really brief question: Is this diagram assuming offshore and onshore wind in the? No, no, I don't think there's any offshore wind. So just but like it's 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 wind and solar across. You can see in this one across um, seven different regions of the Western Interconnect, and only three of them are in California. But most of our electricity will come from California, but a fair bit coming from other places in this scenario. We'll go one, two, three. Oh, wait, uh, are there any safety specifications? Being developed for these hydrogen infrastructures? Yes. Um, there better be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a lot of them. There's all kinds of stuff going on. They've they've pretty much nailed the whole question of safety. I'm, you know, I'll say this and then something will happen tomorrow. But there has not been, I mean, there's all kinds of rules and, and codes and standards and more coming on different aspects, but Hydrogen storage under pressure on the vehicle is, is now highly certified. You can sell them. There's not been an accident in a long time. No one's ever been hurt. Well, maybe there was somebody hurt like 20 years ago, but uh, it's been so far great. No problem there. So that would be one thing, though, that some people might be a little nervous about, that hopefully that problem goes away. And then you, and I, there are a lot of people, and then you, and then will you? No, somebody else was, was wanting. But go ahead. Uh, what do you think about the prospects of hydrogen to use in the fisher choke process uh, and turn into synthetic natural gas? What Germany is doing, they're thinking that they could repurpose their LNG infrastructure, take hydrogen, green hydrogen most probably, and capture CO2 feedstock from either DAC hubs or CCS units and use it to make technically carbon neutral sure. gas. At least, what are yeah. the prospects? I mean, of if that? you're capturing carbon from the atmosphere, then you're technically yeah. neutral apart from whatever emissions from the general system yeah. process. Um, again, she'd probably give a better answer, but um, I, uh, I, yeah, you can. It's mostly about price, but if you make hydrogen, the cheapest thing you can do is use the hydrogen in the end use. The next cheapest thing you can do is probably make methane or methanol might be cheaper. Methanol is pretty cheap to make. And that is a perfectly good fuel, it's toxic, um, but there's a lot of talk in the shipping industry now about using methanol. And then you can go all the way up to building launching hydrocarbons with Fisher Tropes. And that is kind of a holy grail for those, well, not just for those who want to continue to drive internal combustion engine vehicles, but you've got ships, aircraft, and internal combustion engine vehicles. And even in the fastest scenarios globally, there's going to be a huge demand for liquid fuels going out to 2050, right? And it'll all be oil unless we substitute with something. I mean, it even works with grid gas supplies. You don't need the blending problem anymore. I think the U European Union did a study where they found the blend doesn't work with their old infrastructure. Yeah. And you could save a lot of money and trouble by just creating natural gas with the Fisher Trope process. Yeah. That. 
I mean, that's that's something you can do. It, it's just, it, it, well, it used to be like up to two years ago, natural gas was so cheap you wouldn't think about it. But now Europe is like, has none. And for us, it's twice as expensive as it was. So it could be interesting. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I was wondering, uh, and I didn't find much information online. So, is there any effort to hybridizing hydrogen vehicles with diesel or gasoline, or is there any research going on in that area? So I'm doing what about advertising? Uh, no. Hybridizing. Hybridizing. Um, yeah, good question. Um, you could make a fuel cell plug-in hybrid vehicle. So instead of the right now, we do have plug-in hybrid vehicles that got a motor, they got batteries. And you can plug in to charge those batteries, but they also have an engine and a fuel liquid fuel. I own one. Um, it's right there and somewhere. It's right there. Um, but because uh, I drove here. <laughs> um, but no one has that I know of has started to try to build a plug-in hybrid fuel cell vehicle. So now instead of a gasoline and a gasoline engine, you have hydrogen and a load and, and generating electricity, fuel cell. And then you have batteries too that you can plug in. And now you can uh, get your electricity a number of ways. It's kind of the worst of all worlds that you need all those components. And so it's going to be pretty expensive. But it would have maybe some advantages. Uh, they should at least, I think in general, I, I don't know exactly about Mirai, but in general, they need to hybridize them with some batteries on board to manage. The energy it really makes sense to do that. Okay, I don't, yeah. I'm going to cut people off okay. a minute, but we did have a question oh. online, but I think you've already answered it, so it'll be quick. Did your new modeling accounting for the $3 kilo, kilo, uh, kilogram federal subsidy uh, for clean hydrogen? Yeah, but he did ask that, and not yet. No. Not yet. So you'd subtract $3 from whatever's um, one more? One more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, like, I think you mentioned about air travel. So, do you foresee any air travel and like uh, container ships, uh, which are you know really hard to electrify with the better battery? Do you think that's a good question? Air travel and ships both have potential to use hydrogen. I think we're going to see ports using hydrogen for port equipment and airports using hydrogen for ground equipment. That's like one one thousandth of the amount of energy it takes to actually move an airplane or a big ship, but it's a beginning. Um, probably liquid hydrogen for ships is not the most popular, uh, you know, idea right now. Uh, there's there's one one issue is with your at sea a long time you you're gonna have a boil off problem. You're gonna have to manage your hydrogen on board very carefully to not lose it all as you're traveling. But it's also still maybe more expensive than if. You were just storing methanol or ammonia on the ship. Those are seem to be more popular. For aircraft, you, you know, hydrogen is very interesting because it's light, and aircraft want to be light. Um, although the tanks have to be lighter to really get full benefit. And then the emissions are water, which really matters. Except the problem is at high altitude, water is a greenhouse gas, and you're creating contrails, and, you, and nobody knows yet about all that stuff. And it takes a whole complete redesign of an airplane to make it run on hydrogen, and it'll only fly half as far. So that, just a few little things. But but there's uh, Airbus has a ten, ten billion dollar research program now because the EU said you will you will develop hydrogen aircraft, and here's ten billion to do it. So I don't know what Boeing's doing, but they're working on some stuff too. So maybe I mean it might be good for regional aircraft eventually, but then electric planes are coming too. So with that, I'll stop. All right, thank you.